Okay, so my name is Sylvanium Orlinard. I have been or was in Eve University from June 2012 until early February of this year, that is February 2014. During my time in Eve University, I was very active and actually was an integral part in the creation of the Wormhole Campus. And as you may or may not know, the Wormhole Campus are primarily armor tankers. And, well, I can't shield tank worth a darn. I, I think I got a Tech 2 shield tank like a month ago. So I've been playing Eve for almost two years, and I just started shield tanking. That's how much I love armor tanking. So I have lots of experience. I've fitted all my ships with it. It's the default way I go to fit my ships. So you should know what armor tanking is by the time I'm done today. Let's go ahead and go on slide one. Oh, there's a question from Kellen. Are the LSC and NSC primarily armor tankers as well? I want to say no, especially in the LSC. Shield tanking is a lot easier because kiting is possible tanking, not so much in armor tanking. Same thing with NSC. They're, the types of engagements that they go in are very different than what the WHC does. So it lends itself to different type of combat, and different type of combat lends itself to different type of tanking. I did not know that. Thank you very much, Judge. Okay, so go ahead and go into presentation mode on your slideshow and open up the first slide. I can figure out where presentation mode is. I Oh, there it is. So it's view present for those people who don't know. View present. Okay, moving on to slide number two. The subject that we will be covering in this class, we will be covering the advantages and the disadvantages of armor tanking. The skills that will help you improve your armor tanking. How resistances actually work. That includes stacking penalties. The various modules and rigs that are useful when it comes to armor tanking, as well as the implants. And we will talk a little bit about uh, fitting and identifying ships that are actually armor tanked. You don't actually have to see their fittings to know that they are armor tanked. Just how they're behaving will tell you how they're tanked. So moving on to slide number three. Well, before we can start about armor tanking, we actually have to cover what tanking actually is. I know most of you know this, but for those people who do not know, let's go ahead and read very quickly. Nico, I'll answer your questions in a little bit. First of all, how do you recognize that your ships is taking damage? And in the slideshow, you actually see that there is a nice little HUD, commonly known as the donut. That is where basically the status of the ship you're flying is. What really interests me for this class are the three bars at the uh, upper half of the um, little icon. The, ver the topmost bar is shield. The second middle bar is armor. And finally, the lowest bar closest to your capacitor is the structure. When they're all white, that means your ship is perfectly in good condition and you have full shields, full armor, and full structure. When you're taking damage, you first start taking damage to your shields, then you take damage to your armor, and if you're in real trouble, then you start taking damage to your structure. When your structure goes down to 0%, your ship blows up and you don't have a ship, you died. So basically, what is tanking? Well, tanking is the art of improving your ship's defensive capabilities to resist, avoid, or absorb incoming damage, thus preventing or delaying your ship's destruction. Very simple, very broad definition of what tank actually is. Now, Nico had a question. Is the armor or shield tanking used more in uni fleets? That 
Nico actually depends on the FC. Whoever happens to be FC of the fleet decides, are we going armor or are we going shields? Why is it DFC that decides that? It's because DFC has the, is in the best possible situation to know in what kind of fights the fleet will engage and therefore can make the most informed decision as to what kind of tanking is. How do you reach that decision? We will cover that when we talk about advantages and disadvantages of armor tanking. Talking about which, let's move on to slide number four. So tanking strategies. There are multiple ways to tank. The first one, uh, one that people actually knows a lot about is shield tanking. Shield tanking requires mid-slot modules. It increases your ship's signature radius. There is, for those people who are really, really, um, how do I, how do I say this without sounding condescending? For really, really brave, how about that? You can actually go and hull tank. Hull tanking requires low slot modules for your buffer and resistance and mid-slot modules for your repair. Hull tanking usually is a bad idea. That being said, there are instances where hull tanking a ship is the way to go. For, a, for instance, the Orca, as Mr. Zen points out, is a wonderful ship, perfect ship for hull tanking because it already has so much hull. Another instance where you might want to use hull tanking is if you are baiting. When somebody sees that your shields go down and your armor goes down, oh, I almost have them, but then it takes forever to go through his hull. That would be bait tanking or hull tanking. It's actually a pretty good tactic. It's useful usually on a battleship class ship, uh, battleship size vessel. Know that if you're hull tank, you're not doing any damage. You're basically just there to be a big buffer. Moving on, we also have something called sea tanking. Speed tanking requires both low slots and mid slots modules, as well as rigs. It is a usually a good strategy when you're facing bigger ships. So if you're flying, say, an interceptor, and you're trying to basically tank a battleship, no amount of armor or shield tank will actually tank the, uh, the incoming damage of a battleship. But since a battleship can't track worth a darn, maybe speed tanking would be a way to keep your interceptor alive. It's very risky. It requires awesome piloting skills. It is extremely fun to do. but yeah. So, of course, we're not talking about speed tanking. Just know that there is also something called e-war tanking. This is basically tanking by preventing your enemy from doing anything. By, you can't shoot me at all. E-war tanking usually requires mid-slots. They're active modules. It's usually better to do e-war tanking when you're in a group. So say there's a fleet of 30 plus dudes. If you're a sty full of dampeners, you're basically helping the entire fleet by preventing the enemy fleet from doing as much damage it could. That is e-war tanking. Don't try to do it alone. It is kind of stupid. But doing it in a fleet is something that most fleet doctrines actually welcome. I have never seen a uh, E-Uni fleet that did not accept any warship. In fact, the Uni used to be known for being um, basically big clouds of blackbirds because everybody could fly a blackbird at one point in time. And a blackbird uses ECM. Basically, you're just going to have to sit there while we shoot your ship and you can't target nobody. Of course, now we come to the subject of this class, armor tanking. Armor tanking requires low modules. 
It decreases your ship's speed and agility. That is the downside of armor tanking. So there was a question from Galen. How good is speed tanking against missile boats? That, again, depends on the size of missiles that are being shot at you. If you are facing torpedoes and cruise missiles, then yes, speed tanking is very doable. In fact, the Phoenix, which uses Citadel torpedoes or and the other dreadnought-sized weapons, basically another dreadnought can't tank by speed tanking the Phoenix. So yes, speed tanking missiles is very doable. It requires a different kind of um, piloting. For example, the mic warp drive is a bad idea when you're speed tanking missiles. But aside from that, yeah, it's doable. I have done it. It, it works. So moving on to slide number five. Yes, we are on slide number five. The key to tanking. Basically, when you're tanking your ship, the perfect tank is when you are small and fast. That would be the perfect tank. Being small and fast makes turrets less likely to hit you because your signature radius is smaller and your speed is faster than the turret's tracking speed. Armor tanking makes you slower. Shield tanking makes you bigger. So when you armor tank your ship, it's easier for the enemy turrets to track you because you're not as fast. When you shield tank your ships, it is easier for the enemy turrets to track you because you are bigger. If you try to both shield and armor tank your ship, what you're actually doing is making your ship bigger and slower. So that would be the exact opposite of the perfect tank. Since the perfect tank is when you're fast and small. In other words, if you're trying to decide, am I going to shield tank or armor tank? You better decide one or the other. Do not pick both. It is sheer stupidity. Unless you're trying to bait and you know exactly what you do. In which case then, as long as you can prove me you're doing a good job, uh, you have a good reason for it, then yes. So moving on to slide number six. So why would I want to armor tank my ship? Armor tanks have a larger array of modules to choose from than shield tanking. It's true. I have more options to tank my ship with armor tanking than I do with shield tanking. Armor tank modules are all low slot modules. This is leaving my mid slots free for useful utility modules. Utility modules are, oh, mid utility modules are what? Oh, they're warp disruptors, warp scramblers, stasis webifiers, uh, sensor dampener, remote sensor dampeners, turret disruptors, ECM modules, and I believe the target painter is the last one. On top of that, I also have tracking computers and, well, you get the idea. There's a lot of useful modules you can put in your mid slots. And if your mid slots are empty, then it's really, really great. Active armor repairers and hardeners are more capacitor efficient than shield boosters and hardeners. I'll say it again. Active armor repairers and hardeners are more capacitor efficient than shield boosters and hardeners. There is one notable exception to that. However, the rest, uh, the rest of the statement is perfectly true. Therefore, if you have a little bit of capacitor and to play with and you're having trouble staying cap stable, then an armor rep, uh, an armor 
tank is actually better for you than a shield tank, just because of the capacitor reasons. Some ships have bonuses to armor tanking and a large number of low slots available for armor modules. If you fly one of these ships, you might want to think about armor tanking these ships. Moving on, let's talk, let's go to slide number seven. Now, of course, armor tanking is not all roses. There are some very interesting disadvantages to armor tanking. Number one, armor has no inherent regeneration rate, unlike shields. Any damage you have to repair manually. Either you have to have a friend repair you, you have to dock in a station and pay the station to repair you, or you have to have a um, active rep tank on your ship. So you cannot do like the Drake. You cannot do a passive tank and actually just passively tank your level 3 mission. You have to either have, an, uh, have a friend that repairs you or uh, self-repair your own ship. When your armor tank fails, notice it's not if, it is when, because your armor tank will fail. You have less buffer. You're only, you only have structure left before your ship is destroyed, unlike shields where you have both armor and structure still to go through. It takes more skill points to mount an effective Tech 2 armor tank. A Tech 2 armor tank is skill intensive. It's sad, but that's the way it is. Armor modules are all low slot modules, leaving little to no room for damage upgrades. That's right. The other use for low slot modules are actually to increase your ship's damage projection or damage abil uh, making ability. So either by using a module that increases the range and tracking of my turrets, like a, a tracking enhancer, or by using a module that improves the actual damage making ability of my guns. So gyro stabs, heat, sin heat sinks, Magnetic field stabs, ballistic controls, or even drone damage augmenters, which actually helps my drone damage. So that would be the disadvantage. An armor tanking ship will actually do less damage than it's, than a ship of the same type that is shield tanking. So that's the downside. That's the major thing. While shield, you don't have utility mids. Armor, you're not making as much damage. Moving on to slide number eight. Now let's go ahead and talk about the skills you need for tanking. The number one most important skill ever when it comes to armor tanking is hull upgrades. Hull upgrades is the skill you want to have. Having it at anything less than five you're not armor tanking properly. That is how important hull upgrade is. It is a rank 2 skill, if I remember correctly. That means it takes approximately 8 days from level 0 to level 5. That's a little over a week. Now you're only training that skill, but it gives you, it unlocks all tech 2 tanking modules for hull upgrades. That is how important it is. The next skill that is almost equally as important is mechanics. Mechanics gives you a 5% bonus to structure hit points per level. That's basically your haul. So it gives you more buffer after your armor tank fails. It is also required to fit active armor wrappers. Another bonus of haul upgrades, by the way, I forgot to mention, is it gives you a 5% bonus to armor hit points. So having hull upgrades to 5 increases your total buffer before you even have a single module on your ship. Now the next two skills on my, uh, on my uh, slideshow are kind of weird. 
I have shield management and tactical shield manipulation. What? Well, shield management actually increases the buffer that my shield has. That is 5% per level of shield management. That actually helps me tank more damage before it actually goes into armor. Tactical shield manipulation, while required for a Tech 2 shield tank, is also useful for armor tanking. Why? Because of how shield mechanics work. Shields drop below 25%. You have damage bleed. That means that if my shields are at 20% and I'm taking damage, some of that damage is actually going to go onto my armor. Having tactical shield manipulation at 5 guarantees that my shields have to be absolutely at 0% before my armor starts taking damage. If you're planning a skill queue, if you're trying to come up with a skill queue for armor tanking, you are more than welcome to leave shield management and tactical shield manipulation until much later off. But both of these skills up to five, just because it helps your armor tank as well as your shield tank. There is a question from Fade. Why is shield bleed bad? You're going to take the damage anyway, no matter if it's to your shield or armor. Shield bleed could make the difference between you leaving or you dying took a lot of damage and you're already down to say, I don't know, 25% structure, shield bleeding will actually cause you to die. Being able to stay on the field as long as possible is what you should aim for. That is why you are tanking your ship. So it's not horrible, it's just better not to have it. Does that answer your question, Faith? Perfect. Moving on to slide number nine. We have a lot more skills to do. We're not done. There are more armor-specific tanking skills. In this particular case, we're talking about the armor compensation skills. They are EM armor compensation, explosive armor compensation, thermal armor compensation, and kinetic armor compensation. Sorry, that's thermic armor compensation. I apparently don't know how to type. Of these skills, improve the bonus gained for from passive armor hardeners. We have a, a passive armor hardener is an armor hardener does not require capacitor to work. We also have rigging skills, so jury rigging and armor rigging. Jury rigging should be at three. That way you can inject armor rigging. Armor rigging at one allows you to fit tech one rigs to your ship. Armor rigging to four allows you to fit tech two rigs to your ship. It should be noted. It is not necessary to have these skills injected at all for you to be able to fly a ship that has been rigged. They are, however, necessary if you are rigging your own ship. On top of that, the armor rigging skill actually gives you a slight bonus. It's a 2% reduction in the drawback that the specific armor rigging does. Uh, Rain actually did a small mistake. Uh, Rain mentioned that it reduces the mass addition of armor plates. That is false. There are no armor plates in your rigs. There are trimarks. It reduces the... Um, if you're fitting trimarks or... Actually, I'll talk about rigs in a little bit. 
Just know for now that the armor rigging skill actually changed about two or three um, patches ago. Or may I... Uh, actually, it changed in Odyssey. And they don't only affect the mass of your ship anymore. They actually affect other things, depending on which rig you're using. There is another skill. It's called Repair Systems. Repair Systems is absolutely needed if you're going to active tank your ship. It is a 5% reduction in Repair Systems duration. Wait a minute. 5% reduction in Repair Systems duration. That means that my armor repairer cycles faster. That means that my armor repairer requires more passivator to use the higher iron pair systems trained. That's right. If I am fitting a Tech 1 small armor repair on my ship and I have repair systems trained to 1, it's going to take less capacitor than if I have a Tech 1 small armor repair fitted on my ship and I have repair systems trained to 5. In other words, if you're training repair systems, you should also be training your capacitor skills. Capacitor skills quickly are um, capacitor systems operation and capacitor management. The next skill on our list is armor layering. That's an old slideshow. It used to be called armor honeycombing. It is now called Armor layering, it is the exact same skill, it does the exact same thing, they just gave it a more appropriate name because honeycombing was quite simply stupid. What does armor layering does? It gives you a 5% reduction in armor plate mass penalty per level. That's right, there is a module that is a plate, and whenever you fit a plate on your ship, it gives a mass addition to your ship. And finally, but not least, we have the armor resistance phasing skill. Armor resistance phasing affects only one model, which is the reactive armor hardener that I will, that I will talk about later. It, um, it actually does two things in a module. It reduces the duration of the reactive armor hardener by 10% per level, and it reduces the capacitor need by 5% per level. Moving on, let's go to slide number 10. Now, before I start talking about all the modules and whatnot, let's make it perfectly clear what resistances actually are. Resistances are easier to understand if you think about the opposite, vulnerabilities instead. Let's just take an example. I am flying a harbinger with an inherent 20% armor explosive resistance. What that actually means is that I have an 80% armor explosive vulnerability. So if I am taking a single shot that is worth 100 explosive damage, the amount of damage I'm actually going to be taking is 80 damage. Make sense to everyone? Wave in lecture if you understand. Perfect. We, uh, now, let's go ahead and start adding resistance modules to this. The subsequent resistance modules are applied to the remaining vulnerability of my ship. So continuing with the Harbinger example above, we now fit an active explosive armor hardener that has a minus 50% resistance bonus. That is minus 50% that is applied to the 80% vulnerability. So, 80 divided by 50% gives me 40% vulnerability, which means 
that I am going to have a 60% explosive resistance. So far, so good. Let's move on to slide number 11. Continuing from the previous page, we now have a total explosive resistances of 60% or a vulnerability of 40% with just the one module. That's, of course, only to explosive. Now we want to pimp out our resistance even more, so we add the super module to the right, giving us an extra minus 20% resistance bonus across the board. I'm Galen. I'll get to your question in a little bit. Unfortunately, now we are encountering stacking penalties because I have two modules that are affecting the same property on my ship. That is, I have an active explosive armor hardener and a passive energized adaptive nano membrane. Both of these modules affect, amongst other things, explosive damage resistance, which means that I have stacking penalties. So the second best armor resistance module or rig is only 86.9% effective, such that this new module actually only gives us a 20% base resistance times 86.9%, which actually translate into 17.4% exists of resistance. The other resistances, that is EM, kinetic and thermal, are not affected by this, just explosive. This 17.4 resistance is applied to the remaining 40% vulnerability, which gives us, you, you can see the calculation right there on the slideshow, 33 percent vulnerability or 67 cent explosive resistance. Math and stacking penalties mean that it is not possible to be 100 percent resistant to any single damage type. If you did not understand how resistances work, I want you to type an X in lecture. Perfect. Now Galen had a question. With multiple hardeners, i.e. DCU, specific damage hardeners, how is the order of application determined? Okay. Let's put in aside the DCU because that, that is on a league of its own. I have three modules that affect my resistances, so two, um, let's just make it simple. I have one armor hardener, one um, energized adaptive nanoplating, and one energized explosive nanoplating. Those, uh, basically the first, the highest effective module will get 100%. The second highest will get 86%. The third highest goes down to 57, I think, so on and so forth. So basically it starts from the highest possible to the next highest, to the next highest, to the next highest. Does that answer your question, Galen? I assume that means yes. Let's move on to Slide number 12. Now we're, we'll just talk about armor tanking styles. There are two styles of tanking when it comes to armor tank. Active tanking means that you are using armor repairers to repair any damage taken. It depends on your capacitor to function. It is commonly used in missions due to controlled, controllable incoming damage and length of the mission. Can be very effective in solo or small gang PV, five people or less. 
Increasing your armor resistances results in more effectively um, repping hit points per second. The second style of tanking is called buffer tanking. Basically, this is dependent on having a higher amount of buffer on your ship than your enemy. That way you can kill him before he kills you. That is basically what buffer tanking is. It is extremely useful in fleet PvP. It is extremely useful when you have logistics support. Of course, when you have logistics support, you might want to emphasize resistances over total armor buffer. I'll explain that a bit later. It is not very much dependent on capacitor, depending on the modules you use. But you can totally do a buffer tank that does not require any capacitor. Resistances and absolute hit points both increase your buffer. Now, for those of you who are shield tanking and love the Drake for running missions, you're going to say, is there an equivalent to passive tanking? No, it does not exist. A passive tanking armor tank does not exist because I cannot regenerate my armor tank hit points automatically. Moving on to slide number 13. Let's talk about actual modules. We have armor plates. Armor plates are a passive module. They add an absolute, absolute number of hit points at the cost of adding mass to your ships, thus reducing its speed and agility. The speed affected by armor plates actually only matters if you're running an afterburner or a micro-warp drive. It does not affect the base. Tech 2 plates give you the best hit points bonus, but are harder to fit. Meta 4 plates are easier to fit than Tech 2 plates and are a viable option. Different sizes are available, but cost different amount of power grid and CPU. I actually have a video. Very nice chart for you guys on the next slide. Let's move on to slide number 15. There is a question from Nomad. Is shield tanking better for PvE as fit guides would suggest? I honestly don't know because I haven't actually shield tanked in PvE. That being said, I have used quite successfully a Myrmidon to tank level 3 missions, even C3 sites yeah, fairly well. And Myrmidon is a good ship for that because it actually has a bonus to local armor tanking. So um, basically self. Alright, back to armor tanking modules. On the top row, I have the uh, size of the plates, so 50, 100, 200, 400, 800, and 1600 millimeters, respectively. <coughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> and on the leftmost column, I have all of the armor plates' names by meta. So the meta 0 or tech 1 are reinforced steel plates. The meta 5 or tech 2 are the reinforced steel plates 2. You have meta 1s, 2, 3, and 4 named in that column. You actually have the relevant stats for each of the plates on that table. It is quite useful. Go ahead and have a look at it if you want. Okay, moving on to slide number 15. The damage control unit. It's an active module. Big resistance bonuses to shields, armor, and hull. It only suffers stacking penalties with the reactive armor hardener. 
it more than doubles your hull EHP because it gives you, if you're in the case of a damage control 2, a 60% resistance is across the board to your hull. Therefore, it gives you more time to escape after your armor tanking fails. The Tech 2 version is easily the best. You can only fit one of these modules per ship. You cannot fit two, three, or four. You can only fit one damage control unit. The other module, the only other module that's taxed with a damage control unit is the reactive armor hardener. Usually it is best for a ship that has a lot of base armor hit points, like, for example, a battleship. The reactive armor hardener works in a weird way. It is, by definition, reactive. So when I first activate the module, it starts with 15% misses to all resistances. As I take damage to my armor, it slowly shifts resistances to match incoming damage profile. So, for example, I am taking 100% explosive damage and nothing else. My reactive armor hardener will slowly shift over time all of its resistances to explosive. So, it has 60% total or 60 total points to play with. It starts with 15 points in each category. As you take damage, it shifts damages per cycle. That depends on your skills. Um, if you have the um, armor resistance phasing skill up to five, it will take less long, but it will also require more capacitor. The reactive armor hardener only suffers stacking penalties with the damage control. It does not, um, the stacking penalties are not included or for um, passive or active armor um, modules. The way it works is that every, um, every cycle it shifts 2%. So let's go again with my example. I'm taking 100% or 100 points of explosive damage, but I'm not taking any damage in any of the other three categories. That means that at the end of the cycle, it will take two points from EM, two points from kinetic, two points from termic, add them all up, and apply six more points to explosive. Then it's going to do a cycle. If the amount of dam, if the type of damage that is incoming has not changed, then we'll take a further two points from EM, two points from kinetic, two points from termic, and give them to explosive, so on and so forth. No, it only starts shifting while taking armor damage. The question from Galen was, does it begin shifting while taking shield damage, or only when you get into armor, the answer is oh, it only matters if you take armor damage. Moving on to slide number 16. Now we're talking about specific hardeners. So we have the active armor hardeners. They are EM, thermic, kinetic, and explosive. They use cap but are a lot more effective than passive modules. They are not affected by the armor compensation skills. Putting on a Tech 2 armor explosive hardener gives me a straight 60% resistance bonus. Come, uh, up next, I have the energized plating. Those are passive modules and they boost various armor attributes. I have the specific 
<coughs> um, the specific damage types, so energized EM, thermic kinetic or explosive membranes. So we were on slide number 16, energized plating. I was mentioning that there are various energized plating modules. We'll start with the um, M-thermic kinetic and explosive. They actually give a bonus to the specific resistance, just like the active armor hardeners. The difference is you don't have to actually turn them on. They just give it. They are affected by the armor compensation skills. So depending on what level you have your armor compensation skill trained at will define how effective your energized plating will be. There are also two other energized plating modules. They are very special. One of them is the adaptive nano plating, and the second is the armor layering plating. Adaptive nano is really, really cool. Why? Because it gives me bonuses across the board. The Tech 2, I believe, without armor compensations, actually gives you 20% across the board. If you have your various armor compensations to five, it will give you 25% across the board. The layering, the energized armor layering plating, that one will give you a percentage bonus to your armor hit points. Now be very, be very careful with that. It is usually more useful to put a rig that increases the total armor hit points, then it is put the armor layering. Just because the percentage turns out to be better in the rigs than it is in the module. If you're fitting a module to increase the total armor amount of your ship, you're probably better going for plates. <laughs> the Energized Adaptive Nano Plating 2 is very popular just because it is so useful. Moving on to slide number 17. We have one last category. They are the resistances plating. The difference between the resistance plating and their respective energized plating is the fact that the resistance plating does not take any CPU to fit. So if you are short on CPU, you can sacrifice some tank and fit a plating instead of an energized. They do the exact same thing. They just don't give you as much of a bonus. And once again, they, uh, these modules are affected by the various armor compensation skills. Moving on to slide number 18. We also have armor repairs, small, medium, and large armor repairs. There's also capital armor repairs. Basically, those modules repair your armor, but they do so fairly slowly. You have a great ship bonus. I'm sorry. They do so very slowly unless you have a great ship bonus or a fancy tech faction module, which is fairly expensive, probably too expensive for most of you right now. Armor repairs are very useful in missions and solo PvP. They are not so useful in fleet PvP. There are some exceptions. They are dependent on your capacitor to work. So if you get new out, your armor repair shuts off and you die. Combining great resistances with Armor repairs makes the armor repairs more effective because if you take less damage, then your armor repair has to repair less damage, therefore you live longer. If you're fitting armor repairs, you're probably going to want to fit some capacitor modules, either um, cap rechargers or cap batteries or cap boosters just to keep your armor repairs running. You can fit more than one for extra repping power, but once again, more repairs means more capacitor need. 
There is also a fairly new auxiliary armor wrapper. It is a little bit different. You can only fit one of them per ship. They do the exact same job as the armor repairer with a few differences. They use the exact same amount of cap as a T1, T2, or the named armor wrappers. They also use nanite repair paste as a fuel. So the small variant will take one nanite armor repair paste per cycle, the medium four, and the large eight. Whatever size of auxiliary armor repair you have, it will hold eight cycles worth of paste per time. When I did this slideshow a while ago, it was a one minute cycle, but I think in Rubicon 1.3, they will be reducing that to 33 seconds, I want to say. I'd have to check that. But they are reducing the uh, cycle time for reload on the auxiliary armor repairs in Rubicon 1.3. When the auxiliary armor repairer is not loaded, it will only repair three quarters or 75% of the same sized Tech 1 armor repair. However, it is loaded with nanite repair paste. It will repair 2.25 times a Tech 2 armor wrapper. It has the same cycle and the fitting requirements as a Tech 1 armor wrapper. And of course, you're only limited to one per, uh, you are limited to only one per ship. You would use an auxiliary armor repair in PvP, not in PvE, just as nano repair base is expensive. And you would use that as, uh, when you need burst tank. Burst tank is when you need to be able to survive just that much extra longer. Moving on to slide number 19. And last but not least, when we're talking about rigs, we have the remote armor repair systems. Those are most definitely active armor repairs. They repair your friend, they don't repair you. They are far more effective than the local tank. So an armor repairer will be less effective than a remote armor repairer. They are best used on dedicated logistics ships for use during battle or spider tank between multiple damage dealing ships. They use an extra large amount of capacitor. They are commonly used in conjunction with energy transfer arrays. And they're useful for pairing your drones during PvE. Now there's a question from Chao Yuk. What is a spider tank? To explain that, I'll have to give you a uh, fleet doctrine that has been used in the past. Take five or six or seven Dominixes. Now if you know what a Dominix is, you know that it's a battleship and it's a drone boat. So its main damage dealing system are drones. That leaves the Dominix with five high slots. Since the remote armor repair system is a high slot model, you can fit those modules onto your Dominix. And the way you make it work is you keep your Dominix fleet close in together within remote repair range, which is six kilometers. And if one of you is taking damage, then all the other Dominix repair the one that's taking damage. That is a spider tank. All the ships are, make, are dealing damage, but they're also repairing each other. Does that answer your question, Mr. Yuk? Perfect. Any more questions before I move on to rigs, I think? 
All right, then moving on to slide number 20. Now, just like we did for modules, oh, actually there is a question from Nib. Question, so far for PVP, always use auxiliary? No. You can only fit the one auxiliary um, armor wrapper. If you're doing PVP, a good example of a PVP ship that would use a local armor repair tank on it would be, say, the Incursus. That would be a ship I would use that for. Basically, what I would do is I would fit two reppers on it. One's an auxiliary armor repper, and the other is a regular armor repper. Both of the small, uh, both of the small size. I would basically fit a tank. Uh, I'm sorry, um, tackling modules in the mids. And Nosferatu is in the highs. The whole point of the ship is to tackle the battleship and hold it while the fleet kills it. Why are you using a local tank? Because the Incursus has a 7.5 bonus to armor tanking. And if you have, if you have a dual tank with the Nosferatu, so dual repper with the Nosferatu's in the highs, You'll be able to keep your reppers running and survive long enough for your fleet to kill the battleship. That would be one of the very few uses I would see for local armor rep tank in PvP. Now, unless you're doing solo, which is a totally different thing that I don't know so well, so I'm not even going to try to cover it. Moving on to rigs, we have the Trimark armor pumps which are basically just like the um, energized plate layering modules. They give you a total hit point bonus, so for by 15% for the Tech 1, or 20% for the Tech 2. It is very useful when you're buffer tanking, because it increases the total amount of hit points, raw hit points your ship has before resistances. You would probably use a Trimark armor pump before you would use an energized armor layering membrane or an armor layering plating. Fitting this rig makes your ship go slower because it has a penalty to the speed of your ship. And that is countered by the armor rigging skill. We also have the anti-damage type armor pumps, so that would be once again, EM, kinetic, thermic, or explosive. They increase the resistance to a specific damage type by 30% or 35% for a tech 2. They are useful for patching a hole in your tank. So say you have a, an explosive hole in your tank, then you might want to use this, but I wouldn't. Usually using modules, so the hardeners or the energized plating or the resistance plating is more effective than it is to use the anti-damage type armor pumps. They also stack with the armor harners, energized plating and resistance plating. And once again, these rigs decreases your ship's total velocity, making you less maneuverable. Moving on to slide number 21. We have the auxiliary nano pumps which basically increase the amount repaired by armor repairs by 15% or 20% for Tech 2. So that's for your local tank. So if you have a low slot armor repper fitted on your ship, fitting this will make your armor repper that much more effective. Its downside, contrary to the Trimarks, is it increases the power grid required to fit armor repair modules. The Nanobot Accelerator, again, is another mod, a rig that helps with your local tank. In this case, it actually reduces the duration of the cycle time for your uh, armor repair system by 15% for the Tech 1 and 20% for the Tech 2. They're great for active tank, 
but it increases the need of capacitor required to run your tank. And fitting the rig increases the power grid required to fit your armor repair module. Finally, we have the remote repair augmenter. This is for when you're either spider teching or when you are a logistics boat. And basically, this rig does is it decreases the capacitor need for remote repair systems by 20% for Tech 1 or 25% for Tech 2. They are great for solo logistics boats like the Navitas, Exequor, and the Oneros as it helps your you remain cap stable. Fitting one of these rigs means that your personal tank will suffer. That's right, because you're not fitting a trimark to increase your personal tank or an anti-damage type of pump to increase your resistance. You're actually just fitting this rig to make it so it takes less cap to run your tank, uh, to run your remote armor wrappers. And this rig decreases the total velocity of your ship making you less maneuverable. We're not done. We're on to slide number 22, where we have armor tanking implants. We have the Noble Repair System series. So when I talk about implants, there are um, just a quick explanation about how um, hardwiring implants work or how they're named. The last three or four numbers in the name of the implant tells you a lot. So, for example, if I have the 601 Inherent Implants Noble Repair Systems, basically it says this implant fits into hardwiring slot number 6, and it gives me a 1% bonus to... Repair systems. In this case, reduction in repair systems duration. It goes up to uh, 602, 603, I believe, all the way up to 605. They require different levels of cybernetics uh, skill train to use and cost more as you go up percentage wise. So the Repair systems, which is a slot 6, reduces the repair system's duration. The remote repair system, which is a number 7, it reduces the capacitor required for remote repair armor systems. The mechanics, the um, which is slot number 8, increases your total structure hit points, so that's your hull. The repair proficiency, which is a slot 9, increases bonuses to repair system amount. And finally, we have the hull upgrades, which is a slot number 10, and that increases your total armor hit points. For more information about how implants work, I strongly suggest you take the class called Messing With Your Head. Moving on to slide number 23, we have some special implants. The Newmon Family Heirloom, which is a 7% reduction in repair systems duration, at slot number 6. <coughs> and Imper the Imperial Navy Modified Noble Implant. <coughs> Sorry. Which, is, which gives you both a 3% bonus to armor hit points and 3% bonus to Repair systems amount. It's a slot number ten. We have this. Uh, we have two sets, which is the low grade slave and the full slave set. <clears throat> low grade. Uh, when you're talking about a set, it requires all your slots from one through six. That is your skill learning. Imp uh, your skill learning slots one through five plus the slot six for the omega of the implant. They are all names. So for example, if I take the slave set, there's the slave alpha, slave beta, slave gamma, slave delta, epsilon, and omega. Fitting the entire set is what you want to do because once you have the entire low-grade slave set, it gives you 
a 33.83% bonus to armor hit points, increases your buffer. If you have the full grade slave set, it gives you a 53.63% bonus to armor hit points. Again, increases your buffer by a huge amount. Uses slot 1 through 6, as I explained earlier. The low grade variance gives you a 2% bonus to learning attribute. Uh, sorry, a plus 2 bonus to learning attributes. And the full grade gives you a plus 3 bonus to learning attributes. And as um, Mech Someone the Great, Mr. Someone the Great explains... They are expensive. A full slave set, last time I looked, was about $2 billion. <coughs> Once again, I encourage you to take the class Messing With Your Head if you have more questions about implants. Finally, there is one last thing that will actually affect your armor tanking skills, and that is something that your fleet members can do for you, and that is fleet boosts. In fleets, squad commanders, wing commanders, and fleet commanders can pass boost to the pilots under their command structure. Explaining fleet mechanics is way above a class. Leadership skills affecting armor tanking are the armored warfare and armored warfare specialists. The fleet's assistance modules affecting armor tanking are armored warfare link damage control, passive defense, and repair. And finally, the leadership implant affecting armor tanking is armored warfare mind link. There are also two more now. They're, they are the Galente um, Navy warfare mind link and the Amar Imperial Navy. So Federation Navy and Imperial Navy warfare mind link. Once again, fleet leadership is really above and beyond the scope of this class. Just know that if you are in fleets often and you find yourself in a wing command or squad command position often, you might want to consider training these skills because they make your fleet mates last longer. Now, I was supposed to come up with a few fitting examples to be linked in-game for this to finish, but hey, I'm bad, and I completely forgot to um, come up with these fits. If you want, I'll be posting fits about Galente frigates in my uh, Galente Ships 101 class thread that I taught yesterday. I'll be teaching those today. I'll be posting those today on that thread. And all of those fits are actually... Um, they're actually armor tanked, so that will give you an example. Basically, you want to use plates and resistance modules for your buffer. The damage control unit should be present in almost all your fits. And if you're running missions or you're doing some specialized solo PvP, then you'll want to use some armor repairs. At this time, I'll invite questions on uh, in class. Go ahead and ask any questions and I will try to answer them for you. So we have a question about um, Amar ships. And which of the Amar ships is the best tank? At least that's how I read this question. Well, if you're flying an Amar ship, you probably want to go ahead and armor tank your Amar ship. I don't know of any effective fits for an Amar ship for shield tanking. The um, the Amar race has a strong belief in buffer tanking, which is why when you look at the uh, Mauler, for example, it has a 4% bonus to all armor resistances per Amar cruiser skill level. So fitting, um, basically fitting these ships with an armor tank will actually work better because you have a bonus to armor resistances, which is not uh, which takes effect before any stacking penalties. Um, I haven't really fit that many MR ships. I know that they are cap hungry because of their lasers. I would assume that you would fit membranes over 
active hardeners. If you're trying to save on cap, but otherwise than that, um, I really don't know, Hadar. Silvonis asks, which groups, fleet, or areas of space tend to fly armor rather than shield? <laughs> Silvonis, you already know the answer to that question, but I'll answer it anyway. Um, most, not all, but most wormhole corporations will favor an armor tank over a shield tank. The main reason being is you don't need to go that fast because you're fighting usually within 10 kilometers a hole. And the second reason is since you're fighting in small groups, usually 20 people or less, you need your mid slots for tackle, for e-war, for other utility mids. A question from Valen. Should we never combine buffer and active tank, armor plates and repairers? That depends. As a general rule, I want to say, no, you never should. Depending on the situation at hand, it be a reason why you want to do it. For example, if you happen to be flying an Archon, which is the Amar carrier, and you have a triage model fitted, when you are in triage, you cannot take friendly reps coming from other ships because you're in triage, which means that you need to be able to tank on your own. And because you have so much tank to play with, fitting um, repairers and uh, trimarks might actually be an idea. I personally don't know since I haven't flown the Archon that often. I happen to know that Sylvonus has. So Sylvonus, if you want to answer the question, by all means. The, the thing with the Archon is you, you're you not going to get really a quote-unquote buffer fit. It ha Being a capital, it has a large amount of natural armor resistance to it that you can't, putting a 1600 plate on it, for instance, to increase its buffer is going to be very minimal at best. So capitals, though the Archon in particular and other carriers, are able to refit off one another. So when they fly, they tend to fly as a group, multiple capitals at once ideally, or with the mobile depot now, and will refit their fittings. Now they can't really fit away from the active repping local tank because the modules are very large but they will change their resistances. And Archon is primarily about re getting high resistances and using your local reppers. You can't really buffer capitals as much. The most you can do for a buffering a capital when you're actually hull tanking, um, if you're sustaining a lot, a lot of damage and you get beyond armor, a lot of capitals will try to refit to a damage control and reinforce bulkheads, and that can significantly increase their um, their tanking ability when they're that low. All right. Thank you, Silvonis. Any more questions? Then in that case, I will bring this class to a close. Thank you very much for listening to me for an hour and a half and almost cough my lungs out. It was great. I had... Fun teaching this for you. I hope you learned a lot, and we will talk to you guys again later when I have a chance to teach something else.